Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you guys today a little bit about uh, what I've been doing throughout this um, series of lockdowns and online teaching and trying to um, engage with, uh, with our students. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, teaching statistics using musical parodies such as the one uh, you guys just saw. Okay, so these are questions that I, I constantly ask myself and, I, and I, I asked these questions before we went into lockdown, before we, we got into the pandemic. And during it, I, I started asking them even more. So how can I spark the interest of the students? Um, I, I come from Brazil, my background is in biology and then stats. And I remember the classes that I used to have in Brazil were very small. And then I moved to Ireland when I started teaching and the classes are massive. Uh, some of them, of course, not all of them. And, and then I started asking myself, how can I actually spark the interest of those who typically don't like statistics or don't like what they're, uh, what they're looking at at the moment? Uh, and how can I help those who have been afraid or uncomfortable with quantitative subjects? I've had many uh, students actually open up their hearts with me and say, I'd never like maths, I never like stats, I do this because I have to, it's part of my degree and I have to do it. Um, during my biology course in Brazil, I remember friends of mine saying, I'm doing biology because I don't like maths. And, and I was actually the one doing some internships in maths because I all, I've always liked maths. But uh, it's, it's complicated when you don't actually like it and you need to do it. So how can I help those who are afraid, those who are uninterested? Or how can I deliver course material in an innovative and memorable way? So the idea is I'll, I'll teach them something, a concept, for, for example, correlation that doesn't imply causation. And I hope that that's something that in 10, 20, 30 years time, they'll remember. That, that doesn't matter if they don't remember formulae, but all that matters is that the key messages are still there. Ah, correlation doesn't imply causation. So how, how can I do that? So as I mentioned, I came from Brazil and the background there is four hour long classes, two, two, two hour sessions basically every single day of the week and well, of the same subject actually. And when I came to Ireland, things are, are broken down into 50 minute slots. So I had to change the way I taught and the way I was expected to teach because in Brazil, you start teaching and then you have many different problems that you can solve within two hours. And there's a lot that you can do within a two hour window, then you have a break and then another two hour window, there's a whole lot you can do. But with 50 minutes, you start a problem and there's barely uh, enough time to finish it. There's an that's it, that's the end of the lecture. So I needed to adapt. So I was trying to think, how can I keep their attention for these 50 minutes, especially in a class like this? Uh, so one thing that I, that I started doing was, I started introducing some different uh, ideas within my, my lecture. So one of the ideas was short jokes. So that I would do at completely unannounced times. So one example is when I was teaching about the Poisson distribution, I'd say, okay, so that's the Poisson distribution um, goes from zero to infinity. So zero, zero, one, two, three, all the integers up to infinity. If you keep counting, you won't ever finish unless you're Chuck Norris who's counted up to infinity twice. So something like that's a very quick snippet of a joke and I wouldn't let them know. And that would cause some students to react to it. And the others who weren't really interested or paying attention they'd want to know why their colleagues were laughing. And then I started doing this, not every class, but every other class or once every three times. So in introducing some sort of what they call in psychology intermittent schedule reinforcer so that they'd be more interested in trying to uh, listen to what I was saying. And, and, I, and I saw that that was kind of working. And then I started introducing other things such as, for example, magic tricks to teach the differences between coincidence, correlation and chance, to introduce conditional probabilities, to introduce the Bayes theorem and also hypothesis testing and p-values. So, so I asked uh, Dennis if I could do a, a small demonstration here. So uh, I'll just stop sharing for a second. I have a deck of cards here. I'm just gonna shuffle it real quick. I, I need a volunteer from, from the audience, Dennis. So whoever would like to volunteer for um, this demonstration. Is there any volunteers? Walter says he's happy to volunteer. Okay. Thanks a million, Walter. I'd like you to name any card in the deck. So there's 52 options, four suits, hearts, clubs, spades, or diamonds, and then ace to 10, jack, queen, king. So you can name any card you want. The eight of clubs. Okay. So I shuffle the deck, uh, and I'm going into an app now, the uh, chronometer, chronometer app. Um, 
and it looks like this in the Android, right? Oh, can you see? There you go. There you go. So I'm gonna riffle through the hand of the seconds here and you can see, uh, Jesus, the lighting. Can you see there? It stops at a random number. Uh, what number is it? 56. So if I do it again, it can stop anywhere from zero to 59. So now it's 44. So I'm gonna do it again. And whichever number it stops in is gonna be our number. Oh, there it's number one. Okay, that's interesting. So this deck of cards that has been in plain sight at all times that I shuffled, I'm gonna remove it. And I didn't know Walter before, okay? <laughs> so now it says number one on the phone and I'm gonna take the first card of the deck. Walter said eight of clubs and the first card is the eight of clubs. And as you can see, all cards are different. Uh, and I do some sort of demonstration like this. And then I ask the students, what is, uh, there you go. What is the probability that this can actually happen? So I can say, well, there's one in 52 cards. There's one in 60 options in the, uh, the chronometer, the timer. So that's one in roughly 3000. Uh, that's the odds of this happening. And then I can ask them, so that's very low probability. So would you reject the null hypothesis that I didn't tamper with this, that this is not a magic trick instead of something that could happen by chance? So I started introducing these types of things and they would, um, I, I think they would become more interested. So the last thing, the latest thing that I tried to do was actually introducing some music. So what happened was we were teaching through lockdown and everything was online. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna make a video now. And in this video, I'm going to recap probability concepts. So I actually recorded it. It was a five minute long video when I said, okay, uh, so conditional probability definition, P of B given A is equal to da 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 da, -da base theorem. And when I was re-watching it before posting to the students, I thought that, was, that wasn't really nice and I wouldn't really want to listen through all that, even though it was just a recap. I, I would much rather look at a sheet of paper with the formulae. So I was like, okay, so maybe I can sing this and maybe singing this would make it more interesting. So uh, I, I rang a friend of mine and I said, what is the song that people are listening to at the moment? Because I'm not really into pop music and I started getting into pop music after I started doing these things. I said, well, that's that Billie Eilish uh, lady. He, she sings um, uh, Bad Guy and that's the song that everybody's listening to at the moment. So I was like, okay. So I, I created a parody of Bad Guy uh, and with, with the lyrics related to probability theory and concepts and, and um, formulae. And I thought, okay, so I'm gonna just sing it to them during a live interaction. But I wasn't doing anything on a Sunday and I have two rabbits, two pet rabbits and two dogs. At the time I only had the two rabbits. So I started filming them. I was like, okay, I could make a video and put the rabbits in the video for some reason, just because they're cute. Uh, and I started filming this, I filmed the song and then I started editing it. And it, it turned out to be, I, I thought it was actually pretty cool. And I, I showed it to my family, showed it to my wife. And, and then I posted for the students. And they seem to have liked it much more than, than simply looking, for example, at a sheet of formulae. And a nice thing that happened was that the university, they really liked it. They, um, they said that it was great that I was doing these types of things. And that actually propelled me to do more. So this is, uh, yeah, this is part of the first video there. So I was talking about uh, sample spaces, uh, frequentist definition of probability. Uh, that's the that's Peanut, the female rabbit. Flopsy, her brother is right there. You can't really see it. So this is an Irish tin whistle because as part of this song, there's a doo -doo -doo -doo, and it sounds like a flute. So I just pretended that uh, Peanut was playing the tin whistle. And uh, in a second, I'll, I'll tell you why that was a very, very good decision to have the rabbits featured. Uh, and then, well, the project grew, so that was number one. Then I created one for discrete random variables, continuous random variables, p-values, uh, confidence intervals. And these were all part of a module I was teaching at the moment, which was intro stats. Then I created one for the tidyverse, correlation sugar, which was shown uh, 10 minutes ago, Simpson's paradox. There's two more there, which, which are not in this slide. Uh, overfitting and rock curves, because I was teaching some machine learning on second semester. But it was great because uh, from song seven onwards, I actually got funding from the university through a program that teaching and learning here calls the Spark Project, uh, which helped me buy professional um, software to record. And that, that made all the difference in the quality of, of, of the music, the quality of the audio, for sure. Um, 
And it was great because I would spend pretty much the, the full weekend, the full week planning and then the full weekend recording and editing. Uh, and the response was actually really positive. But, uh, but basically the lessons that I learned so far is that it, it does work really well for some people, but it doesn't work at all for others, right? And some are just indifferent to it. But one thing that I, that I, be, I believe is that this is my style. It doesn't mean it works for everyone. So what I would suggest is always be open to criticism, look for feedback, but never stop being yourself. So if you like playing music, by all means, play music. If you like doing magic tricks, by all means, do that. If you don't like either of those, then it's okay. You don't need to actually do it. Um, just be yourself. And, and that's, that would be my, my main point there. I just wanted to show, oh yeah. So there were some nice surprises on the way. So some people started to get to know me through Twitter and through these songs. So Sean became a friend of mine, he's University of Florida. He started using my videos on his courses and he really liked the bunnies. He actually would call those videos, bunnies number one, bunnies number two, bunnies number three. Uh, and I always had to include the bunnies. There was one video where I don't include the bunnies at all and not even for a split second. And I remember being called out for that. Where are the bunnies? Are they gonna return? So yes, I never removed them anymore. Uh, this is a message I got on TikTok. Somebody that, uh, that is not in Ireland actually, I think this person is based in the US and, and I've never met this person, but they just sent me a message all of a sudden. And this is something that was really rewarding because they said they hated these topics, but after watching the videos, they're interested. So that's kind of, of um, addressing point number two that I made initially when, when they are afraid or uncomfortable with quantitative subjects. Um, Hadley Wickham, he replied to my, um, actually I emailed him and then he replied as well and he liked to tweet uh, about the Tidyverse uh, song as well. Basically, and, and when I was doing a report for the Spark Initiative for the funding that I got, I actually put this table together just to see how long it took to make each video. And I, I was a bit taken aback after learning that I took between 22 and 50 hours to make each video. I thought I was taking much, much less time because it's so fun and to do and, and also very rewarding. Um, yeah, so I did some polls with the students. Uh, most, them, most of them uh, are positive to it. Some people just don't like it or disagree. So the summary songs help me understand or learn better. Most of them say yes, but there's a, about 14, 13% 14 say no. Um, what else? I did a word cloud about what aspects of the module did you like? And then videos and songs appeared right in the center of the word cloud. And that was really nice to see. Uh, what else? Uh, your thoughts about the use of mu music to teach and learn statistics. So this is in interesting because it makes everything fun and helpful. So when you're having fun, you're more likely to retain that knowledge and, and learn. I think that's the, the, main, the main idea. Uh, so some feedback here and, and now why the bunnies are, are actually a key point here. So these are two modules. So DS-152 is first year data si introduction to data science, ST-662 is masters and, H and higher diploma uh, topics in data analytics. So most of them say that the summary songs helped. Uh, the original song doesn't really influence whether they listen to it. Sometimes it does, but most of the time it doesn't. Now, this is, an, this is interesting. Elements that made the videos more attractive. For the master's students, number one was the quality of the audio. And in last place, the inclusion of animals. But for the first years, number one was the inclusion of animals. So that, that was interesting to note. And one thing that I actually noticed from this and from actually talking to students is that maybe by showing my animals, showing my house, uh, that made me more relatable to them, that made them look at me and not actually see somebody in, on top of a podium who knows better. It's just, I'm just like you and we're having conversations together about a topic that we enjoy. Um, so yeah, so I have some sentences here from student feedback, but I can summarize them. So one idea is when they found it enjoyable, a great way to bond with the class. So that's what I just mentioned right now. And they can say, show, show the dog more. So my, my dog is called Luna. So show Luna more. Uh, it's easier to learn without having to read too much for those who don't like, uh, who, who, like who likes to, uh, to listen instead of reading. Uh, this is nice. One of my friends in a different course in a different college referenced one of the songs, actually the Correlation Sugar one. He said, it's like your lecture in that song. Just because they score when he's playing doesn't mean he's the reason. So correlation doesn't imply ca causation. Uh, what else? Very helpful summarizing. It's brilliant. Makes it fun, fun, easier to memorize. 
So I thought that this would summarize it. I actually struggle with maths for once I found it enjoyable, something that's not scary, something that's not unattainable or, or unachievable. And it motivated me to watch the lecture. So that's addressing point number one and point number two of the questions I showed at the start. Uh, and sometimes it just doesn't work, it didn't help me, or I didn't watch any of them, so I have no input. But I guess sometimes it just might take a while for somebody to get used to it. And again, this is all valuable feedback. So for the setup that I used, I use right now, I have an audio interface, a Focusrite Scarlett for those who, who want to record and then do. I use a Behringer B1 to record, that's a uh, condenser mic, Logic Pro to um, edit and record, Melodyne to correct the vocals, DaVinci Resolve to um, uh, do the um, video editing, and that's a free, that's free software. Logic Pro, I think it's $300, Melodyne about 400, and that's what I got from funding from, from the university. But this one is free and it's really good. And as a camera, my phone and a very, very cheap tripod. Uh, but this is what I used before. So before I had a, a USB mic with preamp that I got on Amazon about 15 euro. Garage Band for Mac, that's free. Melodyne is free for 30 days as a trial run. Audacity is free to uh, master and, and edit as well. And DaVinci Resolve is free. So you can do lots with um, free resources as well. So. That's about it. Special thanks to the Spark Initiative and Manute University Teaching and Learning Committee. And thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Raphael. That was great. Um, one of the things I was wondering about is exactly um, uh, how you uh, handled the pedagogy in the class here. Were students, for example, required to watch the videos? Did you have any follow up discussion questions or other things? You can speak a little to that. Yeah, so they were not required to watch. They were additional material that I, I, I we use Moodle here in, in Minute. So I would put as an extra tab on Moodle, extra resources or extra material. And these are the songs related to these parts of the module. They weren't required to watch. Uh, and I never made it as, a, as mandatory. No. One uh, thing that I wanted to do was actually get them to participate. So I tried that. I didn't get much response. Uh, I, tried to, I tried to have them send me videos of... Uh, of a dance that they were doing in TikTok for Jason Derulo's song, but they, you know, nobody sent me anything. So I had my brother and sister to actually do, do a dance. Um, oh, actually, Walter Smith had a similar question about uh, follow-up conversations or, or uh, also what I didn't ask about was uh, whether you assessed things related to the videos and to see whether, for example, students did better on those assessments um, when you had videos used in class as opposed to prior times when you didn't? Yeah, so the problem with that, I actually, I'm, I'm gonna try and do that now, but the problem was we had everything face-to-face -face and then we switched to online and that's when I introduced the videos. So there's a major confounder in place because then we had everything online and we also had a different uh, assessment methods before we had written exams and then we changed it to Moodle quizzes. So uh, that was a bit difficult to, 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 to assess, but that's what, what I want to do actually next. So Raphael, I got a question for you. So, I mean, like Dennis and I, we, our, our main goal is that the students learn and it doesn't matter if the reason they're learning is because they get the learning directly from the song or if the songs just create a more humanized, connected classroom culture and community that lowers the anxiety so that they can open up to taking in the, the knowledge, right? So do you, I mean, cause I, cause it sounded like you really recognize that those are different, but, but, but arguably equally important objectives when you write a song, it, you know, when you write a song, are you conscious of, well, this is gonna be more of a content memorizing kind of song. And this is gonna be something just to help them feel connected with me. I mean, how do you balance that or integrate those two objectives? So I, I think it's, that's a great question. And it's actually difficult to measure when you're actually writing a song. I typically just go with it and I, and I write the lyrics. What I typically do, I have a list of concepts that I want to cover. And in some songs, I really cover them very much in depth. So they memorize it. So like song number two, discrete random variables, the, the um, random va uh, variables, the, the chorus had the formula of the Poisson model, E minus lambda, lambda x over x factorial. And I had students actually singing that to me after they would send it. Oh, look, I, I, I will never forget that. So that's good, you memorize the formula. But then some songs, they, I just I lay down what I want to include in the song. Sometimes a formula fits in nicely with the words and sometimes it just doesn't. 
So I don't actually really guide myself to, okay, I want to do something with formulae or not. I just, I just go with the flow, but it, it's a difficult balance actually to, to achieve. So some songs, let's say the tidy verse one is way more about uh, relating to me and, and <laughs> putting on a, an elephant costume and dancing in my garden, uh, and including some words that are related to tidy verse than to actually have them memorize stuff, but others. Or maybe the best of both worlds is the song remains grounded in content, but the video allows you to insert like your rabbit and your pets and, you know, things like that. And that's what makes it the human side. Yeah, especially that Correlation Sugar one. There's nothing about watermelons in the song. And I actually had people ask me, some people ask me, what's up with that watermelon everywhere? There's a watermelon. It's like, well, the original one is about watermelon. <laughs> so, uh, and that's like, and, and I had a student actually say, do you like Harry Styles? To which I said, well, do you like Harry Styles? And they replied, I do. I was like, that's what matters. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a terrific uh, collection, Raphael. And uh, when you mentioned in your, your little data slide that it takes you about a week to do each one, I'd say that's incredible productivity. I mean, um, uh, and uh, we certainly appreciate the group. Uh, thank you again for, for an awesome talk. Thanks very much.